words that simply say, you are an unceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. Thank you very much, Chris, and I'm delighted to be here. It's always wonderful to be back in Texas. My wife and I did spend some time in Texas. We went to Baylor University, among other things, and learned to love it. I would like to ask Jane to stand up. This is my wife, Jane. She doesn't get to travel with me very much. <laughs> but uh, you can find out about me from her. <laughs> But it's wonderful to be here, and we've been looking forward to it for a long time. And now, since I'm sort of the, the front bumper on the car, I want to talk with you a little bit about the conference, and then I will go into the talk that is on page 11, more or less. And, uh, but I wanted to give you a couple of verses uh, to hang this whole thing on. Um, because it says life with God, uh, celebrating lifelong discipleship. And for many people, that sounds like a life sentence. <laughs> and I want to put that in context of what we sometimes around Renovari call the with God life, the with God life. And so let me give you two verses. Um, uh, that will help you put it all in place and understand that discipleship is the greatest opportunity anyone ever has in life. And the first verse is Genesis 1.26. If you would please note it and perhaps you would like to look at it. Because this verse is the one that tells us who we are. And that verse says, speaking... Uh, God speaking, let us make human beings. Let us make human beings. And let them rule. Now you can translate that in other ways. The old way is very distinguished. Sounds like something dignified, and it is. Let them have dominion. Now, you are here in this life to have dominion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm talking about you. It doesn't really matter that much. Uh, anything else about you, where you are, where you're from, whether you're a man or a woman, tall, short, fat, thin, whatever, where you are, God puts you there to have dominion, to rule, if you like, to be responsible, because that's what it means. Let them be responsible. Now, the rest of the verse is kind of uh, strange today, but in those days, there wasn't a lot to have dominion over. So the first thing you get to have dominion over in that verse is fish. <laughs> and then you move up to birds and finally cattle. Now Texans feel comfortable with that. <laughs> but the last thing is creeping things. Right? I just let them go somewhere else. Right? I, don't like, I never have like creeping things. So now you need to update that. So if, if you bring that verse up to date, it will say, let them have dominion over electricity. <laughs> right? Now, where I was raised, down in the Missouri Ozarks, we knew two forms of electricity. One was the kind you collect on your comb and the other kind was the kind that killed your sheep that huddled under a tree. Uh, electricity is not much use in that form. 
you see. But actually, it's very interesting to think about things like that because uh, as Pastor Peterson was mentioning, all of the things that go with power. You see, the history of humanity has been gradually gaining more and more power. And now we've got so much that you sometimes wonder if we wouldn't do better if we didn't have quite so much, you know. Atomic power. Uh, are you sure we're ready for that? You see, there's a problem with rule and responsibility and dominion. It has to be subjected to what is good. And what you want is you want power to be associated with goodness. So you and I are put here to rule for good. For good. And the other thing we need to add, because that won't work unless you add with God. All right? With God. That's the with God life. Now, we had a little interruption of that life in chapter 3 of Genesis. It's called the fall, probably better named the jump. Paul is already working a little bit of an excuse in there. You know, oops, I fell. No, <laughs> Paul. I plunged headlong. <laughs> okay. And I'm sure it didn't take God by surprise. And he knew what to do and how to handle it, but it has been a long and hard process for humanity, and it's a rather difficult process for you and me as individuals. But the object that God had for us has never changed, and that's why you long to do what is good. You long to produce things that are helpful and good. Little children want to make something, and they want it to be good, and they want to give it to you. And then they like to take it back and give it again because they enjoy that so much. Making good, and see, that's part of us. Almost everyone, it takes a very embittered person to do anything else, but almost everyone wants to leave the world a better place. Isn't that true? That's, that's Genesis 1, 26, and you need to recognize that. Now, see, everyone I know wants to be good, if they could. They want to be good, but sometimes they find it necessary to do evil. See, that's the human condition without God. So now I want to give you another verse to go with Genesis 1.26, and that is Romans 5.17. And if, you, if you're able to turn to that, just look at, look at that. It's contrasting the situation. If through the transgression, sin reigned, death reigned, much more, and think about much more now, okay, much more shall grace reign, hmm? shall abundance of grace enable those who receive that abundance of grace to reign through one Christ Jesus. Have you ever seen that verse? Much more than death reigned. Those who receive abundance of grace shall reign in life. You know, I don't like to be manipulative, but would you be willing to say that with me? Much more, they that receive abundance of grace shall reign in life through one Christ Jesus. Do you think of yourself as reigning in life? Now that's what discipleship is. Discipleship is training 
in reigning. Training in reigning. So where you are in your life circumstances, in your family, wherever you are in the course of life, whatever your age is, that is God's gift to you in Christ Jesus, is training in reigning through one Christ Jesus. So in your circumstances, even when the power is off, you are there to reign to reign in life, not somewhere else. We never get that option. You have to reign where you are. You have to be who you are. And that's what this conference is about. That's what Renovare is about. You remember Paul in uh, 2 Corinthians 4 is talking about his life. It's a wonderful passage all the way from uh, the last part of the second chapter of Second Corinthians, all the way through the fifth chapter and into the sixth. It's a personal testimony. Paul is talking about his life. And it wasn't an easy life. He spent a great deal of his time in jail or sometimes in worse circumstances than that. And he said, though our outward man is perish, perishing. And um, that's true, our outward situation is perishing. Uh, I can tell that by looking in the mirror. My outward man is perishing. But he said, my inward man is being renewed, renovare, day by day. While we look not at the things that are seen, but at the things that are unseen, because the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are unseen are eternal. That's discipleship. That's discipleship. So I hope you can take those words and that verse now and try to think about reigning in life by one, Christ Jesus. Reigning in life. That with God means that as you act, God is with you, acting. That's what we're learning. It's a little like power. Uh, for most of us, we couldn't stand a lot of it. But God is sharing with us his power as we can stand it. See? That's why, for example, he doesn't give you everything you pray for. And I'm sure all of you have learned to be thankful for that. See, prayer is a rudimentary power-sharing activity. It's like he gives you as much as you can stand. But probably if you were to raise from the, someone from the dead, it would ruin your life. Just think of what that would be like. And uh, then if your neighbor had that much power, you'd have to worry about that. <laughs> yeah. So God, God is working all of this together. And that's what we're learning as disciples. And of course, Jesus comes and teaches us how to rest in him and love others. And we grow in that knowledge and that makes it safe for us to have the power of God. Um, Isaiah 62, 12, speaking of Moses, says how God caused his glorious arm to go at the right hand of Moses. And I would like you to take that verse also, Isaiah 62, 12, just to think about because it's a wonderful illustration of the with God life. It's just that that's up at the level of atomic power and spiritual things. But God had a special function for Moses. And because of that, uh, he gave special power. God's power went at the right hand of Moses. Now apparently Moses needed a, needed a stick to help him do that. 
You remember his staff and what that staff stood for. And God acted when he used that staff. I've often thought that's, that's an interesting illustration of our human needs. Uh, there's nothing magical about the stick, but it was how God taught Moses about the power. You remember he learned about the stick when God was trying to get him to go to Egypt. And he was trying to back out as fast as he could. And so God demonstrated his power by that stick. He threw the stick down. What happened? Became a serpent. And then the harder move was he had to pick it up. <laughs> but when he picked it up, it became a stick. Now, if you had a stick like that, you could make a mark in life. Yeah. And so it's just an illustration of sort of the upper reaches of ruling, reigning with God. But that is what is meant for every one of us. And uh, now if you look at page 11 of your notes there, you'll have a vision of what I'm supposed to cover. They told me that there was a, a screen up there that would tell me when to stop, but I can't see it. <laughs> so you all are in real trouble. Now, when Jesus comes to us, he invites us into the kingdom of God. Right? That's Jesus' gospel. Repent for the kingdom of God. The kingdom of the heavens is at hand. Um, that means that we who have been out here trying to run our kingdom on our own now have an option. We can bring our little kingdom, which is a pitiful thing, <laughs> into God's kingdom, where it becomes something magnificent. Repent for the kingdom of the heavens is at hand just means redo your thinking. Think about how you've been thinking. How have you been thinking? You've been thinking about how am I going to manage my life? How am I going to get ahead? How am I going to stay alive? And how, am I, how all of the things that I have uh, to worry about. Now, he says, just lay that aside. Now here is your opportunity. You can live in the kingdom of God. That's how your dominion, your responsibility is restored in the power of God. It's a gradual process. We come in through faith in Jesus Christ. Christ has come into the world, lifted up on the cross, and in that way has become a presence throughout all of the world, the cross is the center of God's visibility in Christ. And it stands for many, many things. We can't go into it this morning, but Jesus chose that. He said, I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. And the cross is, among many other things, a manifestation of God's kingdom. a manifestation of God's kingdom. Now, of course, the cross never comes without the resurrection, so it's part of a, of a bigger picture. But you see, the cross em symbolizes the weakness of man in death, nailed to a cross, and the triumph of God over death, raised from the dead to newness of life. That newness of life we are called to live in. So Paul says in Colossians 3, if you then be risen with Christ. See? Now you are entering through faith in Christ into the power of the kingdom of God, and that's where you live. And all of the things that Jesus talks about come in that context. It's very important we understand that. We are invited to trust him and live with him in the kingdom of God, right where we are, right who we are.
That's the gospel invitation. Trust the crucified, risen one and enter into life with him now. And uh, that enables us to understand the importance of what he says in passages like Matthew 7, where you see him telling a story about the two foundations. Matthew 7, 24 and following, or also it's in Luke 6, but it's a familiar story. After teaching, after giving the Sermon on the Mount, as we call it, after giving that, he makes this comment. He says, now, I want to tell you uh, what uh, the response that is proper to my teaching. I want to tell you what that's like. So here's what he says. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them. Now, my version that I use is the New American Standard. And uh, the New American Standard I use because I think it's the best. And when they mistranslate they something, they usually will give you the right translation in the margin. Right? <laughs> And the New American Standard is a uh, reflection of contemporary evangelical thinking. And so they don't say, does them. They walk away from it a little bit. And they say, whoever hears my words and acts upon them. Well, what's that? That might be a little short of doing them, you see. Acts upon them. Well, I, I don't know what that means, to tell you the truth. I thought do them was very good. <laughs> That's pretty clear, isn't it? And uh, it's very interesting how we are worried about that idea of doing them. But Jesus says... Here's the person. Here's the wise person. The one who hears what I says, what I say, my sayings, and does them. And does them. So like a wise man, built his house on a rock. The rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and burst against the house. And yet it did not fall, for it was founded upon a rock. And then he says, I will tell you about another, kind, another man. That man built his house upon the earth or the sand. And when the floods came, the rain came down, um, the foolish man house fell. Right. Now, do you know the song... The wise man built his house upon the rock. Right? You know that one? We sing that in Sunday school. And we encourage the little children to build their house upon the rock. And that's good advice. But usually, somehow, that doesn't come through to ordinary life. And for some reason, doing what Jesus said kind of travels over here into another category, often presented by scholarly people and popular writers as a hopeless ideal that what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount has all that stuff about not being angry, right? Not cultivating lust, letting your yes be yes and your no be a no, turning the other cheek, hard, people say. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said that's the easy way to live. That's how wise people live. And so you see the title I've given to the talk here is 
What do you do after you decide to do what Jesus said to do? <laughs> What's the next step, right? And, but because of the way this is customarily presented, we have to recognize that many folks have never decided to do what Jesus said to do. Right? And there's a, a misperception about it. Uh, so that actually, uh, you know, we might think about having invitations in church uh, to decide to do what Jesus said to do. How would that be? We do have invitations, don't we? That's a good thing. But what are we inviting people to? Sometimes we use language that's very good. Give your life to Christ. Then how could you give your life to Christ without saying, I've decided to do what Jesus said to do? Could you do that? Could you say, Jesus, I give my life to you, but I, I don't think I want to do what you said to do. Do you sense any incongruity there? <laughs> but because we don't really hear very clearly the heart of Jesus, and his teaching. See, we, we don't know quite what to do with that. And we think maybe that if we said that, we would be getting into law and not grace. That would be serious, wouldn't it? And actually, we've seen a lot of people who said, we're going to do what Jesus said to do. And then they fell into legalism. And they took a verse or two of what Jesus said and started the denomination. Right? You know that? That's happened over and over and over again. Take some little statement and make a denomination out of it. Start a movement. We're in and they're out. Right? All of that sort of thing. So there's enough here to be worried about, isn't there? And I think that's what keeps people from saying, yes, I'm going to do what Jesus said. It's because they don't really understand how you go forward in doing that. And they think you can make so many, you kind of go crazy, you know, become a fanatic, a bug-eyed bigot of some sort. And start in deciding who's in and who's out on the basis of their little legalism. Condemning others. And that's terribly sad and unfortunate, but that's the way it has happened. Now, you know, I'm not going to be able to cover all the stuff in the notes there. They're going to send in the hook on me before I could do that. And besides, you know, we have to fix these notes a long time before you come to talk. And you have to serve what you're cooking. <laughs> right? So it doesn't stay the same. It keeps moving around. <laughs> but I'm going to give you the heart of it, okay? <laughs> I'm going to, I, we're, going to, we're going to make it. And I hope that you will go away for yourself saying, now I know what to do. I always wanted to do what Jesus said, but I didn't think it was manageable. But now I know what to do. That's what, that's what I'm hoping you're going to take away from, from here today. So the first thing you want to know, after you get past, we don't earn our salvation. That's there. See, grace is not opposed to action. It's opposed to earning. Right?
Earning is attitude. See? And we want to stay out of that attitude. And if we've genuinely heard the gospel, we know that Jesus took us past that. That the heart of God is far beyond that. And that all along, he was looking for people who would put their faith in him. And Jesus comes now and says, trust me. Put your life in my hands. Believe that in me you see God. That anyone who has really seen me, as he said uh, to Philip, anyone who has really seen me has seen the Father. And the Father is looking for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. That's where the action is. Not outwardly, but inwardly. Right? So we relocate the place of emphasis, not on behavior. Behavior will take care of itself if we get the inside right. The emphasis is on what kind of person am I becoming? What kind of person am I? That's inside. That's who I really am. And um, we understand that the issue is not so much getting into heaven as heaven getting into us. And then getting into heaven will take care of itself. You know, people need to think about whether or not they would enjoy it if they got into heaven. <laughs> and you might think a person who had spent a lot of time avoiding God now wouldn't like it if they got there. Because in heaven there's one thing that's going to be unavoidable and that's God. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it would be a good thing to be real fond of God. <laughs> <laughs> really fond of God now. And that's really what Jesus brings us to, isn't it? Right? And because we come to God, then inner transformation progresses. And Jesus brings us along and uh, changes uh, who we are inside. And then the things that we decided to do that Jesus taught become a natural expression of who we are. What we're looking at is progress in routine, easy obedience. Routine, easy obedience. Routine meaning you don't have to stop and think a lot about what you're going to do. And easy means that you are no longer struggling to manage to do what Jesus said. So, for example, he says, bless those who curse you. Okay. So now, when someone curses you, what comes out of you? Blessing. Did you have to stop and think and say, now, let's see, what am I supposed to do now? What did Jesus say? Oh, yes, I'm supposed to bless them. Bless you, brother. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, generous goodwill invoking God comes down on them because that's what's in you. So it isn't a big struggle. Like, I'd really like to see their head fall off and roll down the street. <laughs> but I have to bless them. <laughs> see, that's the elimination of the struggle. So you might like to think about that phrase, routine, easy obedience. That's what you want. And that's what comes when you change inside. When Jesus on the cross said to the Father, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. That wasn't hard for him. 
That was easy for him. Am I making any sense at all? You see, what would have been hard for Jesus to have done on the cross? What would have been hard? You know, well, it would have been hard for him to rip ripped off a few curses and said, you just wait till my father gets his hand on you guys. You're going to rot in hell. <laughs> hmm? Right? Now, why would that have been hard for Jesus? Because that was not what was in him. See, we have to get that emphasis. It's the change of what is in us that makes it possible for us to do everything Jesus said. So you see, it isn't like that uh, we just remain the kind of person that is alienated from God and full of themselves and think they are running their life. And it isn't that we remain that way and we just sort of put on top of that a layer of obedience. You understand what I'm saying? We change deeply inside. And the first move of that is faith. Because we have to come to believe that God so loved the world that he gave his son. See, now then that changes our picture of God. That's the fundamental change. That's what takes us back to Genesis 1, 26 and says, I understand. I am here with you. When I have responsibility to rule, that is with you. So when I am confronted with things in life, I am counting on you. See, the primary moment of faith in concrete reality is expectation. What am I expecting? That's why perfect love casts out fear. Fear is anticipation of evil. Fear is anticipation of evil. Now that I have brought my life through faith in Jesus Christ into the kingdom of God, no fear. No fear. Oh, wow. Does that change everything? You know. What happens when someone curses us? They try to put something bad on us, don't they? Right? That they may simply, some form, some people think, as someone said, they think God's last name is damn it. <laughs> and someone says, God, damn you. Well, that's a pretty fearsome prayer, isn't it? Now, if someone says that to you, standing in the kingdom of God, you don't need to worry about it, do you? You know that's not going to happen. <laughs> that's taken care of. All the bad things that they might say, that they want to see happen to you, you're standing in the kingdom of God. That's, that, that's worth an hour's talk in itself, but I know I'm not going to do it. But now think about that verse in John. Perfect love casts out fear. How does that work? Well, perfect love is, first of all, God's love to us. Right? And then it's God's love through us to others. And then it will go through others and come back to us. Perfect love casts out fear. Now, fear is gone. Has that changed your life? If fear is gone, you're in a different world. And everything that happens to you will have a different meaning. Right? And that's just a part of the change that comes inwardly as we step into the life of Jesus. So when he tells us, now go teach everyone to do everything I said. Can we do that? Well, if we start where he said to start, by making disciples. Making a disciple 
A disciple is someone who trusts Jesus and is learning from him how to live in the kingdom of God as he lived in the kingdom of God. That's a disciple. That's what you're learning. Lifelong discipleship, as it says on your folder there, is about that. Now, we, most of us are pretty slow learners, uh, but actually we'd learn a lot faster if we had some teaching that helped us. And a major part of the teaching is precisely how this business of obedience comes about. So that we stop trying to do things and focus on becoming the kind of person who does it. Okay. Would you like to keep the Ten Commandments? Now actually, Sometimes we kind of dump on the Ten Commandments and act as if somehow they're not important. But I'll tell you, try them out for a day. Well, just start out. Start with the first one. Don't start with the last one. I am the Lord thy God. Right? Hey, that's the whole deal. You accept that. That's who I am. That's where I live. And then you go on to the rest of it, the teachings about God and about primary relationships to other people. And finally, uh, that verse that defeated Paul. You remember Paul said the one that beat him was thou shalt not covet. Paul was sort of an alpha dog in his business. And uh, he was defeated because he could not stop coveting the good things that other people had. And so the transformation that he had to come is expressed in Philippians 2, where he says, let each consider other better than himself. Hmm? Now, where do you have to be in order to do that? You have to be standing in the life of God. And when you're standing in the life of God, then you are happy that others have the good things they have. And you don't feel impoverished because of that, because you are living in abundance of grace and reigning in life through one Christ Jesus. So the good of another does not diminish you and you have become the kind of person who doesn't covet, not because they are keeping a grip on themselves and when they start to covet, they say, don't do that. <laughs> You're not coveting comes out of the generosity that springs from your life in God. Am I making any sense? See, it's the inward transformation of life. And when you come to disobedience, and uh, uh, Peter's denial of Christ is one of the most instructive things that we can ever think about. Um, uh, Peter said he would die for Christ. And you know what? He intended it. He really meant it. But Christ was teaching him about what else there was in him that he didn't know about. That's exactly what it was teaching. What else is there in him that he doesn't know about? What was in Peter's mind when he denied Christ? See, that's what you want to think about is now, here he is, He's standing here, and this little lady, little girl, says, Oh, you're one of Jesus' disciples. Now, you have to think about what was going on in his mind that made him say, No, I'm not. That's the level of change, you see, that has to happen if behavior is to come under the control of intentions. Well, what was Peter thinking about at that moment? 
What was he thinking about? Well, he was probably thinking about he was in a pretty dangerous situation. Don't you imagine? And as is always the case in temptation, his focus had narrowed. Do you know that's how temptation always works? And it strengthens as it gets narrower and narrower and narrower. See? Now, if you're tempted to have a donut, and you have a broad horizon, the donut will look very small. But if you don't have a broad horizon, the donut will look very big. And you find yourself saying things like, I've got to have a donut. Now that's the general form of temptation. What was Peter's basic problem? His mind was not where it should have been. He should have had a broad horizon. Now he didn't know that about himself. He had to learn that about himself. And Jesus let him do that. Do you think Jesus could have kept Peter from denying him? Suppose Jesus said, what I really want is Peter not to deny me. Could he have arranged that? Sure he could have. He could have just given him lockjaw at the right time. <laughs> right? Or had a medium-sized angel stand and whack him. <laughs> but what did Jesus want for Peter? Jesus want, wanted Peter to become the kind of person who from inside his mind and his emotions and his feelings wouldn't deny him. And so he let him go through the process of training very carefully because, you remember, he told him ahead of time this is going to happen. And he really wanted him to learn because you might think that Peter would have said, well, I did just what Jesus said I was going to do. Boy, am I going to put a lock on my mouth. You might think he would have said that, wouldn't you? So that the second time around he wouldn't have done it. But you see, that's not where Peter was. That's not what he had to learn. And Jesus lets us learn in the same way. He arranges us for possibilities of failing. And failing is often the only way we can find out who we are. And if we are submitted to Christ, then our failures become upward steps in Christ-likeness. Mm -hmm. So what do you do after you decide to do what Jesus said? Mm -hmm. You decide to go to school with Jesus and become inwardly the kind of person who will do the things that he said. That's where spiritual disciplines come in. We need a lot of them. The importance of understanding that spiritual disciplines work by indirection. They don't deal with our failures directly. That's behavior modification. Do you know the difference? Behavior modification is not character transformation. But character transformation is behavior modification. Okay. Now someone had better tell me what time it is. Does that, that mean I should quit? All right. So now that's what we want to be thinking about as we think about Renovari and we, uh, the wonderful methods that Renovari practices and teaches. You're going to be looking at more of those closely uh, today are all designed at transformation of character. And our churches could also do that, and we hope they will, that they would take as their goal the transformation of character into Christlikeness that would mean a revolution of behavior that would sweep the world. Because 
When that happens, you don't have to make an announcement. You don't have to make an announcement that a light is going to shine. You just turn it on. And if we can take that as our goal, wherever we are in our fellowships and our life, then we will see the kind of transformation that will bring Christ into the world, the kind of transformation of love that Jesus in John 17 said, make these my disciples one with one another with the unity that we have, Father, and then the world will know that you have sent me. That's Christ's idea of evangelization. Thank you. God bless you.